Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming out this afternoon, uh, both here at the Cook DeWitt Center and online through our live stream. My name is Eric Harvey, and I'm an assistant professor in the multimedia journalism program at Grand Valley State School of Communications. I'm very excited to present to you all a first in a speaker series that brings innovators, practitioners, and theorists in the broad fields of journalism and broadcasting to our campus. Much of what we're going to discuss this afternoon will deal with the role of independent journalists in a democratic society. But I want to stress that today's talk will address the role of communication more broadly in the conduct of social life and the pursuit of social justice. As we talk today about the Flint water crisis, we're talking about issues not only of journalism, but also of persuasion, public relations, citizen-led health communication, and performance in the broadest sense of the term, and how each of these domains of human communication is shaped by power at every step. The Flint water crisis, through the frame we'll be discussing it today, is an issue not just of human health or politics or race or economics, but of course it's all of those, but it's also a matter of the potential of human beings, citizens and journalists alike, to recognize wrongs and attempt to right them by raising their voices continually, collectively, and loudly. Kurt Guyette exemplifies the role of the ethically guided independent journalist at a time when the field seems to be beset on all sides by economic forces and institutional realities. He has worked as an investigative journalist for 30 years, 18 of which were spent in the news department of the Detroit Metro Times. While there, Kurt reported and wrote probing pieces about a variety of subjects, including education reform, the city's bankruptcy, Mayor Kilpatrick's downfall, and right-to-work legislation. In 2013, Guyette took a unique position, which he still holds, as investigative reporter for the Michigan chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union tasked with reporting and writing about issues related to the state's emergency manager law and open government. Guyatt's role with the ACLU is unique in this country and led to his deliberate pathbreaking work with Flint community groups who were struggling to make their voices heard after the city's water supply was changed to the Flint River. As you're aware, this decision created no shortage of dire health issues for residents, the majority of whom are African American, living in a city with a poverty rate of 40% and an average monthly water bill of $150. Kurt's early on the ground reporting was recognized by the Michigan Press Association, which awarded him their Journalist of the Year Award for 2015. Kurt has also appeared on national news and public affairs programs such as The Rachel Maddow Show, Tavis Smiley, and Democracy Now! discussing the Flint crisis and other aspects of his reporting. I could go on for a while. But instead, I'd like you all to provide a hearty Grand Valley State welcome to Kurt Guyet. <laughs> okay, so, to get started, um, I'd like to begin, can you go ahead and bring up the first slide, Sam? Um, with the most recent development in the ongoing uh, Flint saga. Um, last week, Governor Snyder's uh, self-appointed six-member Flint Water Advisory Task Force returned what has been characterized as a fairly blistering report on where the fault lies for the crisis. Specifically, the report accused state officials of, quote, government failure, intransigence, unpreparedness, delay in action, and environmental injustice in the matter. Governor Snyder has spent the past several months attempting to avoid blame for the crisis. In your view, what is the impact of this report? Well, one thing it does is validate the reporting that we started doing. Uh, basically confirmed everything that we have been saying since last July when we first uh, published the internal uh, memo written by Miguel del Toro and did a story mm -hmm. uh, sounding the alarm about the potential for lead in, in Flint's water and everything had happened uh, since then. So it was gratifying in that sense that it, it really validated our reporting and subsequent reporting. So how would you characterize Governor Snyder's sort of reaction to the crisis as it unfolded, kind of in the months ahead of the report being issued? Slow motion. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also in a, a October press conference where he was in Flint to announce that he was going to let the city switch back to the Detroit system, his uh, quote at the time was that you know, there's nothing to be served in, in placing blame for this crisis. 
you know, relentless positive action, look forward. Uh, but people weren't having it. Uh, he was forced to appoint this task force and, uh, like you said, issued a blistering report uh, showing primarily that this, this state is the one that's responsible for this. And there's, there's no really denying that. As much as the governor still tries to deflect responsibility and, and blame and saying, well, this is a failure of government at, at all levels, which is an effective dodge in that there's some kernels of truth there, but it also misses the point. This is, the state owns this disaster. His administration owns this disaster. It's his emergency manager law that directly led to the crisis, as that report points out, which was another important thing about that, which is they shed a lot of light on the role of the emergency manager in this, and that was an important thing to, to bring out. Uh, but he, it didn't matter if he appointed this task force or not, there's now criminal investigations both on the state and federal level. Uh, so people are uh, certainly interested in not blame, but culpability at this point. At this point. So could you advance the slide? Yeah. Um, actually, I have a, a <laughs> we didn't plan this segue, but um, so this, this, uh, the previous slide and this slide are, are featuring excerpts from the task force, ta task force's report. Um, and so this is a, a, an excerpt from that report that's available as a PDF. Um, uh, and it specifically noted that, quote, emergency managers replaced local representative decision making in Flint, removing the checks and balances and public accountability that come with public decision making, end quote. So back in March 2014, your first post for the ACLU Democracy Watch blog warned about Michigan's emergency manager laws, and this is part of your, uh, your beat at, at the ACLU. And so can you explain this law a bit um, and talk about what's at stake for citizens with this law? Yes. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the emergency manager law gives extraordinary amount of power to appointees of the governor who essentially become dictators uh, over the towns and school districts that they're appointed to take charge of. They can break collective bargaining agreements, abolish existing ordinances, create new ordinances, sell off assets. Uh, about the only thing, the one thing that the law says specifically that they cannot do is miss a bond payment. So the uh, banks get paid no matter what. In the case of Flint, it was people get poisoned, uh, but the banks uh, still get paid in order to make sure that the budget is uh, balanced. And one thing that has been uh, in the news recently, it's, it's not a news story, but it, it was just uh, published again, is the state revenue sharing cuts, which essentially pushed a lot of these cities that were uh, marginally uh, situation uh, financially, these massive revenue sharing cuts uh, pushed a bunch of them over the edge. And so essentially the state set the stage to take these places over by cutting their revenue sharing, which then puts a, in danger of insolvency. The fact that their state revenue sharing cuts put them in danger of insolvency then gives the state justification to come in and take them over. And when they take over a city, uh, local elected officials only have whatever power the emergency manager chooses to give them. They only get amount of pay that the emergency manager chooses to give them. So essentially they become employees of the emergency manager rather than the independent democratically elected uh, officials that they're supposed to be. Uh, I would argue that any action taken by any city council or school board under emergency management is not legitimate because they're not independent. They are really employees of the emergency manager. And there's great, great danger that the ACLU's position is that you shouldn't be going and taking away democracy away from people. And Flint, tragically, is the most egregious example of, of what can go wrong when that happens, when you take democracy away and replace it by an austerity-driven autocracy, which is what emergency management is. And so 
these emergency managers, so there's, there were four in Flint, right? Were there? There were. Here's one of the things about the emergency manager law. Because they're given all these extraordinary powers, uh, when the law was written, uh, 18 month limit was put on their, their term in office because you figure, give them all this, all this power, uh, very few constraints, get in, clean up the mess, get out of town. Uh, except that the problem is that it is not a managerial problem, it's a structural problem. And unless you fix the structural problem, it doesn't matter who, who the, the manager is. And so as a result of that, because they were not able to get in and get the job done in 18 months, what the governor started doing is having these emergency managers quit at 17 months and 29 days. Uh, they leave, often get appointed someplace else, and so a new comes in and the clock starts ticking again. So it's a loophole in the law that they're exploiting. Uh, and in theory, uh, a town could remain, or a school district could remain under state control in perpetuity. Uh, that hasn't happened, except Detroit schools, uh, which have been under state control since 2009, uh, just keep going from one emergency manager to another to another. And since they've been under state control, their debt has increased by at least $500 million. Uh, and up until Flint, that was my uh, most egregious example of the failure of emergency management. Uh, but Flint, uh, in terms of the damage done, uh, far surpassed that. Hmm. Um, so, segueing to Flint specifically, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the uh, racial and economic dimensions of, of this particular um, issue. So um, many have commented that what happened in Flint is in, in, in a certain way unimaginable in a, in a let's say a white middle class city um, or suburb. And so in your view, how do economics and race um, factor into these sorts of inaction and, and denial on the part of state government? Well, first off, uh, wealthy white suburbs aren't being taken over by an emergency manager. That's the bottom line. Who's getting taken over by emergency managers are cities with high poverty rates and majority African American communities. Uh, Flint and Detroit, cities I know best, are in the positions they're in because of flight from the cities. Detroit at its peak was close to two million people. Now it's maybe 680,000 people. And instead of being filled with a, a really strong, vibrant middle class uh, with people with good union jobs at auto manufacturers, uh, now the poverty rate, like Flint, is above 40%. Uh, Flint had 200,000 people at its peak, now it has 100,000 people. And part of the reason uh, that the racial makeup is, is the white people uh, left and, and increasing the amount of uh, percentage of uh, minorities there is that for a long time, uh, black people weren't able to buy homes in the suburbs. Uh, federal housing policies uh, wouldn't give loans, to make loans available to, uh, to people of color. And so whites were allowed to leave, the blacks were pretty much forced to stay, and as the tax base eroded, it created a downward spiral, uh, causing more people to want to leave because of police and fire services, increased taxes, things like that. And so the, it's inherently, uh, race is inherently a part of, of this uh, issue. Um, so you've been studying state politics for a long time, whether in California or, or, or Michigan. And um, when you look at the Flint crisis, are you, are you able to fathom the sort of rationales that might lead to a situation like this? Not only, um, I mean, you, you can see that, that, you know, from the government's perspective, switching the water source might be, it's like purely financially driven. Um, but then the fallout. Um, can you characterize the fallout in terms of your experience kind of studying state government? Have you ever seen anything like this? I haven't I haven't seen anything close to this. I mean, you see it with the private sector, 
uh, where they have uh, you know, maybe contaminated a water supply or something like that. The, the movie Aaron Brockovich is a, right. is a good example of, of something like that. But that's you know, private corporations that are doing that. That's not your own government. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that has been tough psychologically on, on the people of Flint to realize that you know, you sort of expect corporations to, you know, be bottom line driven and mm -hmm. cut corners and look to protect the interests of their shareholders. Government is there to protect us. And to have your own government poison you and then try to cover it up and attack you uh, for trying to uh, tell the truth or get to the truth is, I, there's not even words to, to describe it. I could imagine how I would feel if, if where I lived, if that had been done to me, you know, I don't, I don't know what I, what I would be doing. Right. But it, psychologically, it's, it's very, very difficult, especially if you, you know, you're a patriotic person, which a lot of the people that I've been working with up there are, you know, to, to think that your government did this to you is very, very difficult. Right. Um, so two, there were two, there were a lot of figures in the story. This is a big story um, with a lot of different dimensions. And, and two important figures who have kind of emerged from it um, are a Flint citizen, Leanne Walters, and a, uh, an academic researcher, uh, Dr. Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech University. Um, so I'm going to start, can you pull up the next slide? It's a, photos. Um, uh, oh, one more. Sorry. There we go. Um, so can you talk about uh, Leanne's role in the story and, and how you came to know her? Yeah, I mean, uh, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this if it wasn't for Leanne. Leanne is a really, truly remarkable, remarkable person. Both Leanne and, and Mark are, are both remarkable people. Uh, Leanne was just determined to get to the truth. She educated herself. Uh, in the documentary that we made, we interviewed her in April of 15, one year after the switch. And she sat there and just laid out the cause for the whole crisis. Leanne found out that after the switch to the river, uh, the Flint water treatment plant stopped adding corrosion control uh, phosphates to the water. She found that out from uh, someone working at the, the water plant. And she told Miguel Del Toro at the EA. But we sat there, she was sitting on her porch stoop, and she starts saying, this is, we have all these old lead pipes, they stopped adding corrosion control, the river is very corrosive, and the water's just tearing these pipes apart, and that's what's causing lead to get into the, uh, the water. That was back in in April. So this is just a private citizen that took it upon herself to educate herself about these issues and laying out exactly what the problem, because you know she had been working with uh, Del Toro from the EPA and Mark Edwards, you know, talking to people from the water treatment plant and just laid out the whole scope of the problem. And, th and then you have the governor who says, oh, I learned in uh, October about the scope of the crisis. So you have just a, a housewife uh, who had educated herself, became an expert on, on the issue, laying out the problem at the time when the state officials, city officials, are denying that there's a problem mm. at all. It's pretty remarkable. It is. Um, so before we talk about uh, Dr. Edwards, can you uh, advance to the next slide and play that clip. Um, before you play it, um, so this is a clip, so, so Kurt has, has worked um, uh, on a documentary, and who is your collaborator? Kate Levy. Kate Levy, um, called Here's to Flint, it's available online. Um, and so this is a clip uh, from that documentary um, in which, um, so one of the crucial aspects of this kind of reporting is, is acquiring and understanding data. Um, and because there's such a lack of trust of government officials and offices in Flint um, and, and, and conflicting reports about whose data is, is, is correct, um, citizens worked with, with Edwards um, and the ACLU to do their own testing. So I'd like to play a brief clip from the documentary and then you can talk about how this kind of came to be. Thanks, Savannah. In the face of official denials, 
The question became how to get to the and citizen-led study of Flint's war. Mark Edmonds applied for an emergency grant from the National Science Foundation. Is there a little bit of feedback? Was sent to Flint in August. You can go ahead and, you can actually go ahead and mute it, and we can play it, go ahead and play it through. Um, yeah, we can just kind of let it roll here. So can you talk a little bit about how Dr. Edwards came into the story and then some of the community groups um, and, and, and sort of how the, uh, the community groups and yourself and, and the ACLU and, and Dr. Edwards sort of triangulated your, your efforts there? Well, after uh, Miguel del Toro wrote an internal EPA memo, uh, basically talking about Leanne's house, Edwards uh, did an independent sample of uh, Leanne's house and found lead levels of 13,200 parts per billion. So to put that in perspective, the federal action level is 15 parts per billion. 5,000 parts per billion is hazardous waste. So two and a half times uh, the level it takes to be characterized as hazardous waste. Uh, Del Toro saw that. He confirmed Leanne's information that corrosion control wasn't being added to the water and said the basic science indicates that uh, there's, with a high degree of certainty, a uh, lead level uh, problem in, in Flint. Uh, we published the memo, we uh, wrote a story about it, interviewed Edwards, Del Toro, Leanne, and the state wouldn't talk uh, to me, they blew me off, uh, didn't respond to repeated attempts to uh, for them to comment. But after the story came out, Michigan Radio, which has done an incredibly good job on this story, uh, picked on it, on it very quickly. They, the state did talk to them. Uh, Brad Werfel, uh, then Director of Communications for the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, uh, now out of a job, uh, told them that the people of Flint didn't have to worry about lead in their water. It wasn't a problem. They should just relax. That was the quote, right? Just relax? Just relax. Right. And so the question at that point became, well, how do we get to the truth? How do we get this beyond being a he said, she said story? And conversations between myself, Edwards, and uh, groups that were members of the Flint uh, Coalition for Clean Water, came up with the idea of doing our own independent tests. Uh, Edwards got a grant from the National Science Foundation, sent 300 test kits to Flint in mid-August, also loaded up a minivan full of students, came up from uh, Virginia Tech for a couple days to do additional on-site testing, but the, the main testing was a citizen-led one of the scenes was uh, in the basement of the church, and we would have people come in and show a video and give them instructions about how to collect the water samples that would then be sent back to Virginia Tech to analyze. And for a little over two weeks in August, we worked like crazy to get these kits distributed, make sure that the distribution throughout Flint was as even as could be, to hit as many parts of the city as evenly as could be, and then get them collected. And uh, the, like I said, the, there was about six or seven of us, and we were working like crazy, and as soon as the uh, samples got, started being returned, we would ship them back to Virginia Tech, which then began working like crazy to get them analyzed, because as soon as they started analyzing, uh, they, they saw these really high lead levels. And so by the time they had analyzed uh, samples from 24 homes, they knew that this was going to be a, a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, statistically, that, that was enough to, to show. Right. They, they knew it was going to be an issue. And I started writing about it. Other people, one of the things that happened is because I had the inside track, right? I'm, I'm working with these guys. And so... I would get the information first and write about it. 
And to some extent, that kind of set a, a template that the other media would follow. I was kind of setting the pace and made it easier for them, explained it for them, and, right. and then so it was easy for them to pick up on it, and they continued to keep kind of the same narrative uh, thread as I had started. Right, and you know, one of the things that really struck me watching the documentary was that, you know, not only is this a, a, a citizen-led effort that's involving a, a, a university that's, you know, thousand miles away and, 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 a, and an investigative reporter for the ACLU, but you're having to do this in the first place because you're, you're, you're aware that um, at every step that the, your own government is going to be challenging the validity of anything that you say. Yes, absolutely. Uh, all along the way, we were very uh, cautious in our approach and doing things uh, like sitting down and, and making sure that every part of the city was being, being tested because we knew that they, they were going to uh, try to challenge our results and wanted to, to make sure that there was no legitimate openings. We can't stop them from saying whatever they were going to say, but we could prevent them from uh, exploiting any you know, real chinks in the armor. So we tried to make it as bulletproof as possible in, in how we approached it and, and how we handled things. Right, so to, to the degree of having people in, uh, initial their samples and then putting packing tape over the initials so that there was no, there was no possibility that people's uh, samples would be yeah. disturbed. Yeah. Um, so even after this though, if I'm, if I'm correct, didn't the MDEQ, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, didn't they still challenge the validity of the university-sanctioned national organization or national health organization results. The um, the original uh, title of the documentary uh, I originally wanted uh, deny an attack mm -hmm. because that that was the state's mo throughout this this whole disaster was to deny that there was a problem and to attack the people who were trying to tell the truth. First, they attacked Miguel del Toro, saying that he was a rogue employee and discounting the uh, information that was in his uh, memo. And one of the key things in the memo, and one of the things that uh, propelled us to want to do our own test was the fact that uh, the state of Michigan's protocol, they found a loophole in the uh, federal lead and copper rule testing, which says that before you sample water, you need to let it sit for at least six hours so it has time to absorb lead. What the MDEQ was instructing uh, people to do was, before letting it sit for six hours, that, to run their water for five minutes, which got all the water that might have been sitting in a uh, lead service line. Service line is what runs from the water main. Water main goes down the middle of the street, off of the water main to each individual property, is a service line. And uh, for older neighborhoods, those service lines are often made of lead. And then there can be lead plumbing in, inside of people's homes. But they, um, so they, <laughs> there's so many things going, going <laughs> on with this. It's a big story, yeah. but, but by having people flush their lines beforehand, they were ensuring that it would the bare minimum. Then they also put an upper limit of eight hours, which is also not in the rules. So they, they artificially created this very narrow six to eight hour window when people were doing water sampling. Whereas in real life, <coughs> excuse me, you might go away for the weekend, come back and you know make a pot of coffee or something, right? So you're, gonna, you're getting water, it's been sitting there for a couple days, not six to eight hours. And Del Toro and Edwards both said that this is a completely bogus way to be conducting your water sampling and that it's guaranteed to minimize the amount of lead being found and you're going to miss worst case scenarios. And so that was one of the, the main reasons that we want to do our own tests. It's like, well, what it's really like if, if you're not cheating, if you're actually doing the, the test the way that the spirit and the letter of the law <laughs> indicate. So you've mentioned Miguel del Toro, and I want to specify, so 
you know, he's sort of, so he's an employee of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, and so he wrote an internal memo, um, and that memo, did he, he sent that memo to Leanne Walters, right? He gave a copy to, to Leanne, and the reason he did that was because he had been an EPA employee for 28 years, knew how the bureaucracy worked, I think was, was frustrated with uh, the internal politics to some degree, but that he was afraid that the memo would get watered down and buried in the bureaucracy. And he thought that this was a, a public health crisis that needed immediate attention, and that the way to do that was to get the word out. And so he gave a copy of the memo to Leanne, and I don't know if they discussed what she would do with it or, or not. Uh, I didn't ever ask them that. But I think that the intent was that Leanne was going to try to get it publicized. And because we had done a, a short uh, documentary uh, just prior to that and gave credence to what the residents were saying and taking seriously their concerns about the quality of the water and focusing attention on the emergency manager's role in all this, uh, she gave the memo to, to us and we you know, published it and, and did a story around it. Um, so now that the Flint story has sort of gone international, one of the primary questions is where does the fault lie? How high does it go? Can you get people kind of um, uh, admitting that they you know, bear some responsibility for it? Um, and so what do you claim to those who say, so I think Governor Snyder is, is, is implying, not, not directly, but saying something like, let's keep the past in the past and kind of move forward. So how, how, would, how do you respond to that sort of thing? Like, let's not get bogged down in the quote, you know, the blame game or something like this. Let's, let's you know, I have a 75 point plan to, to kind of improve uh, our situation. So what, how do you respond to that? You know, that's like seeing a, a, a body on the, on the street with bullet holes in it and, and saying, oh, you know, no need to uh, look for blame here. I mean, people were poisoned. Kids are damaged for life because of this. If there were crimes that were committed, people need to be prosecuted, you know? So the whole no blame game, you know, just doesn't cut it. And, and he's been forced to move beyond that, uh, the appointment of his task force. Right. Uh, you know, he t I think he took a considerable amount of heat uh, with his initial position that uh, there's no need to do blame. We're going to do some sort of action act, after action report, he called it, after action report, uh, to see if there, you know, mistakes were made, you know, sort of passive mistakes were made. Uh, but we want to move forward and, and uh, make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. But, you know, there's a problem now and we need to keep our attention focused on on fixing it, which is absolutely crucial to the people of Flint. But the people of Flint also want justice. Uh, it, you know, they didn't want uh, to hear there's no blame here. Uh, like I said, their, ki you know, their kids are poisoned. They've gone through hell for two years, man. Uh, th I think that the people, a lot of people up there have something equivalent to uh, post-traumatic stress going on. It's, it's, been, it's, it's been brutal. You know, you're, you're there and you're, your hair's falling out, you're getting these weird rashes, your kids are getting sick, you don't know what's going on, but you know it's something to do with the water because these problems weren't there bef before you were forced. They didn't have any choice. They were forced to use this water. That was, decision was thrust upon them. And so all, all those factors combined, uh, what I hear consistently from uh, people of Flint, along with wa wanting the, the help and the, the, the compensation and the services, they also want people held accountable for this totally avoidable man-made disaster. Hmm. Can you uh, skip ahead three slides? Let me go, yeah. One, there, right there, yeah. Um, does this look familiar? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so one of the more surprising 
elements, I think, for a lot of people of your Flint reporting is that it's coming from, for a lot of people, a fairly unconventional place, uh, the ACLU. A lot of people, when they hear about the American Civil Liberties Union, they don't think about reporters, they think of lobbyists or lawyers. Um, um, and so we have right here an email that has been uh, released through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and this was sent by a Flint uh, City public information officer. Um, which we can see here. And so your work with the ACLU, um, it says, somewhat discredits his objectivity. Right. Um, well, maybe, but uh, <laughs> facts are facts. And the Del Toro memo was a fact. The fact that they were pre-flushing is a, is a fact. Uh, so, you know, they could try to uh, call into question the credibility uh, all they want. Uh, the bottom line, though, is whether the reporting stands up to scrutiny. Uh, because credibility is everything to, to a journalist. If you don't have credibility, you need to find another line of work because it's not worth anything. And so they, they could call into question all they want uh, the, the work that I did or my motives or where I'm coming from. But uh, as, long as, as long as the information stands up to, to scrutiny, they, they, they can say those things all they want. And one of the things that was heartening about the task force uh, report from the, the governor was that it did substantiate. Now, not one thing that, that has been reported has uh, been discredited uh, so far. You know, all the essential elements have just been confirmed multiple times. And so a lot, you know, a lot of times when people talk about journalistic objectivity, what they're really saying is, you know, you've got to hear both sides, right? So, you know, both sides need to have their say. Um, in this case, you know, how would you characterize, quote unquote, the other side of this issue, the, the state? Well, they lied a lot and uh, provided false assurances. They cheated on their uh, testing and then use those uh, cheating tests to try to say, look, we've done, we've tested samples all over, all over Flint and we are within the federal uh, standards. Our water is, is safe. And so again, the attack and uh, deny was their, their MO. They, like I started to say, they, they attacked uh, Del Toro. Uh, Mark Edwards, uh, Brad Werfel uh, sent an email to a Flint Journal reporter saying, you know, these, these guys pull uh, that, this rabbit out of uh, the hat wherever they go, essentially impugning the integrity of Edwards. And Edwards is, is the most, uh, you know, ha has more integrity than, than anybody you would ever want to meet. And then when uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha did a study of blood, uh, lead blood levels in, in Flint children, uh, a spokeswoman for the governor accused her of uh, splicing and dicing her data. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's uh, slander. You know, to accuse a, uh, a researcher of splicing and dicing their data to come to uh, some chosen conclusion is, is really slanderous. And, and that's what they did every step of the way was to try to uh, discredit people who were telling the truth, which the uh, governor's task force uh, laid out pretty clearly. They, they said the MDEQ was more intent on uh, attacking people who ultimately proved to be telling the truth than they were in doing their own job, which was supposed to be to uh, protect uh, the citizens of uh, Michigan. Um, so I'd like to, uh, ask one more question and then open it up to, to a Q and A. Um, so, Congress, between three and ten million older lead pipes still remain around the country, even though they were technically banned uh, mm -hmm. thirty years ago by Congress. And so, um, for instance, in Lansing, they've been replacing lead pipes there mm -hmm. since two thousand four, as the Board of Water and Light. They've replaced thirteen thousand five hundred lead lines, forty two million dollar project, six hundred and fifty. To go, and so um, when you when you when you think about um, the ability for cities to actually kind of take action and, and do this kind of work, um, I guess two questions. One, um, 
what would you recommend to people um, you know, around the country or around the world to, to make sure that a flint doesn't happen um, elsewhere? And second, you know, how possible do you think it is to do the kind of work that, that Lansing um, has been able to do in replacing those? those faulty lines? Well, it's, it's very expensive, and that's one of the reasons, uh, you know, one of the things that Leanne Walters did was start to do research to find out if there's other states that uh, do things like the, the pre-flushing, and I think she's identified uh, 19 where they find loopholes that they try to exploit, because there's, there's a huge incentive to not find lead. Because if you end up being over the federal action level, then you have to start replacing these, these lead service lines, which is very expensive. Uh, you know, can vary, but you know, $4,000 a, a line is kind of the, the average cost. And so you know, units of government at just about every level are, are struggling. And, to have to incur this cost of replacing these lead lines is very high, so that's why they cheat. And, but the other hand is, well, what's the social costs, which are enormous when you start looking at uh, one of, kids exposed to lead, uh, their IQ is lowered, they develop learning disabilities, behavioral problems, uh, so they're more, expensive to educate. They're also the kinds of kids that end up in the school to prison pipeline, which is what's prison cost, $40,000 a year maybe, or up to uh, house a prisoner. Per person, right. So, you know, it's, it's short-sighted, aside from just the moral right. aspect of it. You know, save money, poison kids. Uh, diminish their capacity, make it so they cannot live up to their, their full potential because, because of the damage done to them, because we don't want to spend the money necessary to protect them. Um, there's a microphone at the front of the aisle here that, that you can see. Um, and for those, if, uh, I'd like to open it up to, to Q&A here. Um, and so uh, for those of you who have the question, please, Feel free to come on up to the mic. If you're unable to, to make it to the mic, we can have somebody bring it to you. Um, but uh, please, anyone. And, and uh, uh, introduce yourself as well. Okay. Hi, I'm Ray Blissett. I'm a sophomore here. And a quick question. Um, earlier you said that you said the um, media outlets um, helped you advance the story and helped follow along with your narrative. What media outlets um, help do that? Well, primarily uh, Michigan Radio. They, they've been really uh, stalwart in covering this story, but also the, uh, the Flint Journal, and then eventually I think the, the local TV stations. We were talking about this earlier. The, the arc of this story is, is very interesting. You know, it's first oh, the ACLU of, of Michigan is, is reporting this, and then Michigan Radio picks up on it, and then the, the Flint Journal, and then the local TV stations, and then after uh, Hannah Atisha issued her report, then it was, became like a regional, statewide story. And then in December, when a new, newly elected mayor, uh, Karen Weaver in Flint, uh, declared a state of emergency, uh, then that's when the, the story really uh, blew up and went national and, and international. Okay. Hello, my name is John Van Holley and I'm a junior at Grand Valley State. Um, this being such a big story, how do you decide when it's right to publish this for the general public? Yeah, the, the memo we worked pretty quickly on uh, the memo was uh, written on uh, June 24. Not sure when Leanne got it, but she got to me pretty quickly. We published our story on, on July 9. And partly because we agreed with what Del Toro and Edwards are saying is that 
people need to be alerted to what, what's going on, to the potential danger. Because one thing uh, Mark Edwards uh, said at one point is that the, the biggest danger is not having lead in your water. The biggest danger is having lead in your water and not knowing about it. And so there was a really a sense of, of urgency to help sound the alarm in as uh, significant a way as possible. My name is Louie and I'm a sophomore as well at Grand Valley State. Um, I just had a question concerning the um, credibility that you have. Uh, you said you've been shut down by the state like multiple times after attempting to like get some facts uh, in your article. Like, does that impact your credibility, your credibility or like objectivity on the story at all? Well, in one one of the other uh, emails that uh, came out, they. Uh, the MDEQ says, oh, this, this must be what the, the reporter from the ACLU has been calling about, and they, they put quote marks around the, the, the word reporter. Uh, you know, but um, I don't, to, to a certain extent, you know, if they don't want to comment, that's, you know, that's, that's their choice. There's nothing I could do about that. Uh, it certainly didn't help Brad Werfel to not respond to my comments in the long run. He resigned in disgrace. Uh, so, you know, not, not responding to me didn't really affect the story one way or the other. Matter of fact, uh, he would have been better if he kept his mouth shut and didn't say anything to uh, Michigan Radio rather than give false assurances that the water was safe when it wasn't. Uh, my, my attitude has always been, you know, because you know, I've never worked at the New York Times. You know, if you work for the New York Times, I would say probably about 99% of the time you're going to get your phone call returned. You know, people do not not respond to the New York Times. They don't necessarily respond to the Metro Times, which is where I worked in, in Detroit. Uh, so I was used to uh, having people not, not comment. Uh, but. When you have the documents, when you have the evidence, it, it doesn't matter, uh, really, ultimately, if they respond or not. The story's getting out there whether they respond or not. For the, you, know, you who might be uh, public relations rather than uh, journalism majors, you know, not responding is, is never a good idea. I, I can tell you that. It just makes you look bad. And that's what I would put. Uh, repeated attempts were made to uh, get comment, and they refused to comment. You know, they just look bad. It looks like they're hiding something, which they were. Thank you. So, Lucas Escalada, I'm a junior here at GBSU. You mentioned that, you know, the story did get national coverage, and you know, you just mentioned you work for the Metro Times. So, how much difficult or easier did your job get once the national outlets started getting involved? And looking at the process now, is it looking to the future, do we need those local journalists to do more of the research and keep the story going? Or are we going to count on the New York Times to come in and keep the ball rolling? Well, interestingly enough, the uh, public editor of the New York Times wrote a piece about this and chastised their own reporters mm -hmm. for not picking up on this sooner. Is this Sullivan? Yes. Yeah. And, um, so, the, by the time the national media picked up on it, I, I was kind of not done, but, but the, the heavy lifting had all been done at that point. Uh, the initial exposure of the lead problem was the, the most crucial thing. Uh, doing our own test to prove uh, that the lead levels were much higher than the, the state claimed. The uh, investigations I did into uh, what the state and city were doing in order to skew the test low, that, that, all the heavy lifting was done. Uh, what's happened since then uh, is mostly the result of uh, the governor uh, being shamed into releasing emails and documents that, uh, you know, 
brought out some more information, brought out the Legionella stuff, which the governor disclosed voluntarily on his own. So, you know, there has not been a, a, a huge amount of investigative reporting done that's uh, furthered this story uh, since our initial work. You know, more interesting details come out, more damning information's come out, more information's come out about who knew what, when, uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, what the national media did was amplify the story. They didn't really further the story very much. Uh, Patrick Mass, Jr. at Grand Valley. And uh, early on in the interview, you mentioned racism as a big part, and a more contemporary issue that's been coming up in the last 30 years is environmental racism. And I was wondering if you believe that Flint is a case of environmental racism, as was the BP oil spill and the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, you know, in some, in some ways, it's difficult to extract different threads from the, the entire fabric of, of this. But the, but the threads of racism are, are undeniable. Like I said earlier, you know, white communities have not been taken over by emergency managers. The communities being taken over by emergency managers, Benton Harbor, Flint, Pontiac, uh, Hamtramck, uh, Detroit Public Schools, the city, the city of Detroit, are all majority African American. Uh, so you cannot, you cannot get away from the fact that the, the, there's a very, very uh, strong racial component to this. It, it's, just, it's just part and parcel. But it's also a class issue, too. These are, are poor cities as well. Uh, in terms of politics, they are not cities that uh, traditionally deliver a lot of Republican votes. Uh, so, you know, the governor, the legislature didn't have to worry about losing votes as a result of uh, taking over these cities. The, the other thing that's, that's part of what's going on here, and, you know, talking about race, especially mostly among white people, is a, is a weird thing to do, but that you know, I, I can tell you, I live in a, in a suburb of uh, Detroit, St. Clair Shores, and majority white. Uh, well, it's the home of uh, what used to be called the Reagan Democrats. Uh, and there is definitely a line of thinking among whites when looking at a city like Detroit or like Flint which is these people cannot run their own business. You know, as, as like despicable as, as that is to say, I'm saying that I hear people talk like that quite a bit. It is like literally these people cannot run their own business. And so it seems okay to them to have a white governor and a primarily white legislature pass a law that then enables them to come in and take over majority African American communities and take away the voting rights of the people who, who live there. It's, it's considered acceptable because it's, because you know, they, they can't handle this, so we need to come in and take care of this and clean up their mess for them. Well, we saw in Flint what happens when you take away democracy from people. My name is Sierra Prosser, a sophomore journalism student, and I am just curious if you believe that at any point the state took any positive action um, such as appointing the emergency managers, or at any point they made a right turn during the Flint water crisis? No. They, uh, <laughs> hey, couldn't hurt to ask, right? No. They, uh, at one point, the, 
in just about a year ago, in, in March of 15, the Flint City Council voted to return to the Detroit system, and the emergency manager said, it's unconceivable that you would want to do this. Uh, you can't afford it, and besides, the water's okay, so shut up and keep drinking it, essentially. I mean, that weren't his exact words, but the emergency managers, one of the things that really cemented my determination to uh, pursue this story was at a meeting, I don't know if it was end of February, beginning of March 15. And at that point, the issue was uh, total trihalomethanes, uh, which are a carcinogenic byproduct of chlorine. Because the Flint water treatment plant was totally unprepared for the uh, difficult and complex task of, of treating the Flint River water. Uh, for 50 years, Flint had been getting its water from Detroit. It was pre-treated, had corrosion control in it. It would arrive in Flint. They would add some chlorine to it and send it on its way. It's polishing operation is, is the industry term for what they were doing. They went from that to having to treat this river water, which is, you know, they, they called it GM sewer. Flint's the home of, of General Motors. Uh, but Detroit's water comes from Lake Huron, which is much less corrosive, much cleaner, and also much more stable. It, it doesn't change a lot from season to season, whereas the river, if it rains a lot, that changes it. If it doesn't rain a lot, that changes it. In the springtime, when the snow melt with the salt from the roads is going into it, that changes it. So it needs to be constantly monitored and, and uh, adjusted to. And they really didn't know what they were doing. And so initially the problem was bacterial contamination from E. coli, and they had to issue a series of boil water notices. In order to kill the bacteria, they upped the level of chlorine. Up in the level of chlorine put, created dangerous levels of the total trihalomethanes, which were at unacceptably high levels for months before the state and the city told people in January of 15. So that was the issue when I first started going up there. I'm sitting at this meeting and Jerry Ambrose, fourth emergency manager, was addressing citizen concerns. And someone in the audience yelled out, why didn't you tell us about the TTHMs? And Ambrose responded, as soon as we found out about it, we began to address it, which is not answering the question. And they, so they yelled it out again. Yeah, but why didn't you tell us about it? And he said, as soon as we found out about it, we started to address the problem. But that's not telling us. Why didn't you tell us about it? And Ambrose responds, well, I'm telling you now. And it was just so callous and so disrespectful of people that he was supposed to be there serving, and, and it just, in a way, crystallized uh, something, which is about the emergency manager law. No elected politician would ever talk to his constituents that way. Trump might. But otherwise, uh, a, a you know, typical politician would not respond that way to the people who are responsible for keeping them in office. They would never talk with that kind of disregard to the people who are keeping them in a job. The emergency manager didn't have to care what people thought at all. That's supposed to be one of the strengths of the emergency manager law, but it's also a major weakness of the emergency manager laws, that they really have zero responsibility toward the people that they're supposed to be serving. All their responsibility is to the, the state, the governor, Department of Treasury, to make sure that they're uh, balancing the books. Hi, I've got a question for you too. I have laryngitis, mm -hmm. but I'm Nancy Levenberg. I'm a faculty member here at Grand Valley. My question is, when GM decided that it was going to discontinue using Flint River water because it was causing its parts to rust, how come that didn't send off the alarm bells with everybody else? If they say, 
if GM can't do, use it to produce parts because they're rusting, what is it doing in human bodies? And the response was, well, you know, this, these are very sophisticated uh, metals that, that we're using and highly uh, susceptible to corrosion. And so, yeah, the water's corrosive, uh, but we need super duper clean water over at, at GM uh, so that it doesn't rust the parts, uh, but it's really okay. And it was really not so much the corrosive effect of the water on the human bodies, this was a corrosive effect of water on the infrastructure, which was causing the uh, lead pipes, the particles to, to leach into the water. But alarms should have gone off. If it's, yeah, if it's rusting engine parts, what's it, what's it doing to those lead service lines? Which is Del Toro, that was the importance of the Del Toro memo, which is to say, here's what it's doing. It's, it's causing the, the lead to leach into, into the water. But it was more, it was more denial. And, and protection of capital, the engine parts were protected and people were poisoned, which goes to show a lot about the, the thinking of uh, both behind the emergency manager law and the uh, idea that you run government like a business, right? And part of running government like a business is maximizing the, the profits, and, and that's what they were doing. They were max helping GM maximize its profits and the actual human costs. That wasn't so important to them, unfortunately. Thank you. Time for one more question. Hi, I'm Sandra Vazgech. I'm a junior here at Green Valley. Um, obviously, challenging an institution like the government takes a lot of courage, so I was wondering, throughout your investigative process, did you ever have any fear of being scrutinized or attacked by people um, personally for exposing the government? Well, it is not just the government, but you know, as, as journalism students, uh, everything you do is scrutinized, you know? When, when we make mistakes, you know, it's out there for everybody to see. And if you make too many mistakes, you're doing a new line of uh, work pretty soon. And so being careful, making sure that your facts are correct is journalism 101. <laughs> and so it is not whether I'm taking on the government or whatever power structure uh, I'm taking on. It is, you don't want to do anything that's going to damage your credibility. And that means making sure that your, your facts are, are straight, no matter who it is that, that you're writing about. You know, one of my first jobs uh, was as a, a sports reporter at a, a small daily newspaper. And you learn pretty quickly, if you misspell a kid's name, you know, uh, on the junior varsity football team or whatever, his mom's on the phone the next day <laughs> saying, hey, you misspelled my son's name. And so, but people take it seriously. And if, you know, if you can't get someone else's, someone's name right, uh, people are going to say, well, how can I believe something else this person's saying if they can't even get their, the name right? And so, you know, there is no... There is no unimportant story uh, because your credibility rides on every story that, that you do. Hmm. Well, on that note, um, I'd like to, uh, before we bring the talk to a close, I'd like to um, thank a few people. Um, you're, you're, you're seeing this kind of massive operation here, uh, uh, the live stream, and then uh, the talk is being recorded, um, and it'll be available online um, in a bit. And I want to say a special thanks to Professor James Ford um, uh, and his multimedia journalism students. I'd like to also thank um, uh, School of Comm Facilities and Equipment Manager, uh, Scott Vanderberg, um, and uh, James Ford's Multimedia Journalism students. I'm going to run through their first names quickly. Uh, Talon, Zach, Andrew, Bobby, Reagan, Savannah, Stephen, Jessica, David, Preston, Dustin, Taryn, Ryan, Kyle, and Mackenzie. Uh, can we give them all a round of applause, please? <laughs> Phenomenal job. Um, 
So to continue following Kurt's work, I recommend that you go to ACLU Michigan's Democracy Watch blog at aclumich.org. Uh, while there, you can screen the entirety of the Here's to Flint documentary that Kurt helped produce, which I highly recommend. Um, and so on behalf of the Multimedia Journalism Program, the School of Communications and Grand Valley State University, um, I'm gonna thank Kurt very much for attending and thank you for attending um, here at Cook DeWitt and also uh, via the live stream. And uh, we will see you again in the fall. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.